Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mira Yuval Davis, and I would like to invite you all and to welcome you all to the third webinar of SAHE, Social Scientists Against a Hostile Environment, which this time gives me a special pleasure because it's also the book launch of my very old friend and colleague, Floyd Anthias, and I'll speak about it in a moment. But first, I want in a few words to mention to those of you who don't know yet that SAHE is a group uh, of um, social scientists, both member of the Academy of Social Science, fellows of the Academy of Social Sciences and non-fellows. Uh, we started during the original so-called refugee crisis and we started to organize public meetings. And then we also uh, co-wrote a collective report with, on migration, racism, and the hostile environment. And um, from the contribution point of view of social scientists. Um, unfortunately, the, our first uh, target, which was Academy of Social Sciences, that we wanted to sponsor it as a sponsored other reports on other aspects in social sciences. I think during the time we wrote, it has gone a bit too conservative for the report, but I'm delighted to say that the British Sociological Association and the relevant research group within the British Sociological Association and um, some research centers, and even more so some very important migrant organizations and uh, anti-racist organizations have all sponsored the report and distributed widely. And I hope you all have had an opportunity to read it over the uh, SAHE uh, website and to use it. I myself have recently used it. I'm involved in Jewish Voice for Labor Education Group and use the uh, part of the report when we try to contextualize anti-Semitism within other um, forms of racism and racializations. Now, as I said, uh, today is a book launch of I suppose one of my oldest friends in, in, in Britain and definitely somebody I've worked closest than with anybody else uh, very early on. And this is Floyd Anthias. We both met as members of the sociology division in Thames Polytechnic. Both of us still working on our PhDs uh, uh, dissertations and mothers of young uh, babies. Or, uh, and uh, it took us some time to see how much our interests, both politically and theoretically, collude from different, somewhat different social positioning. And the crux of it came some years afterwards we were both members of the sex and class group of the CSC Conference of Socialist Economists, which was really not for economists, but for all radical social scientists at that time. And we, uh, and, and there was a discussion about what should the group work on. And both of us raised the issue that we worked on the interrelationship of sex and class but we have to raise also the interrelationship of both to issues of race and ethnicity, uh, race and class. I mean, gender, gender and uh, sex, sex and class. Yeah, sorry, not race and class, sex and class. That we have to add issues of race and ethnicity. And at that time, they're all some brilliant feminists 
who have worked very hard on issues of racism and discrimination and human rights since then, but at that point, they turned to us some very indifferent faces and said, yeah, it's interesting, but it's not the most important thing and we have other things to work on and so on. So as a result of that, Floy and I started to work together and the outcome has been in 1983, we wrote the Feminist Review article contextualizing feminism, gender, race, and, uh, and class divisions, which in today's language would, would be that we have written on intersectionality. And uh, we applied our approach few years later in 1989 to an edited volume on women and national reproduction, woman nation state. And in 1992, we, um, we published the book Racialized uh, Boundaries. Um, this is a uh, woman na nation state. And this is uh, racialized uh, boundaries uh, race, nation, gender, color, and class, and the anti-racist struggle. And really, all this common work for both of us, I think, crystallized the foundational theoretical framework within which both of us have worked since, which was against reification and homogenization and uh, an intersectional approach, but a, a fluid and not additive, but mutually constitutive and shaping. Since the, 1980, uh, the 1990s, after the publication of Racialized Boundaries, Flo and I continue to work in the same areas, some areas, some one of us were more interested than others, but basically in the same field, although we didn't continue to work together, except I think for one article written with um, Elena Kaufman some years later about migration policy. So, um, and, and yet I believe, and of course Floya would have her chance to contradict me if she, once that although of course we have had a lot of discussions and sometimes disagreements, basically the foundational theoretical framework that we developed then continued to guide us in some, uh, in some way in all our f uh, future work. And I don't think that it is incidental that when I published my book, uh, on the politics of belonging, intersectional contestation, which was more or less the development of my development of our theoretical framework, even in terms of the titles, today, uh, Floyer's uh, book, so is not politics of belonging, but translocational belongings and not intersectional contestations, but intersectional dilemmas and social in inequalities. So obviously I am very proud and very pleased to be able to open the book launch of Floyas. And we have a panel of fantastic speakers uh, who are going to speak about the book and then uh, there's going to be a conversation between Umu Terrell and Floya about the book. And after that, you would have an opportunity to ask questions. You can write the questions throughout the webinar on the chat, but please just focus on questions rather than very long commentaries and discussions because we found in the past that it distracts the attention of people who are trying to follow both the chat and the speeches at the same time. Please also 
mention whether your question is for a specific person or a speaker or is a general one that you want everybody to respond. Um, so I'm going now to uh, transfer the, the chair to Professor Umu Terrell, whom I am, is somebody else that I love and feel very proud of because we met quite a few years ago now, but first when she came to study in our MA in Gender and Aspect Studies at the University of Greenwich. And now she's a professor at the Open University. And she's going to introduce the other speakers. Ubu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Niera. Thank you for, for this really nice introduction. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the speakers with a brief biography. Um, and starting with, with Floya, Floya Anfias, who is an anti-racist and feminist academic, and her work has been concerned with inequalities and different forms of oppressions and power relations and their intersections. She's held professorships at a number of UK universities and is Emeritus Professor of Sociology and Social Justice at the University of Roehampton. Floria was born in Cyprus and migrated as a small child with her parents to Britain. Uh, her most recent book that we are launching and celebrating today is Translocational Belongings, Intersectional Dilemmas and Social Inequalities, um, published with Routledge. Her other books include, some of them have been mentioned, of course, by Nira already, Woman, Nation, State, um, Racialized Boundaries, um, then ethnicity, class, gender, and migration, Greek Cypriots in Britain. Another one is Into the Margins, Migration and Exclusion in Southern Europe, and Gender and Migration in Southern Europe, Women on the Move. Another one, Rethinking Anti-Racisms from Theory to Practice. And Paradoxes of Integration, Female Migrants in Europe. Is there a problem with the sound? Okay. I think not, not, yeah. 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 Okay, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Might have to turn this down a bit or perhaps otherwise if everybody can unmute them, uh, sorry, mute themselves, perhaps that would help. So, um, Okay, thank you. So as Nila mentioned already, I met Floya uh, actually during my master's, that was my first year in the UK, and it's really wonderful to be uh, hosting her book launch today. Uh, Floya is one of the intellectuals and activists whose, uh, whose work has always inspired me and always um, been a really rich resource for thinking and um, uh, well, activism as well. And the same is true actually for our other speakers as well today. So Aftar Bra is a professor emerita at Birkbeck College, University of London. She's published widely on questions of culture, racism, ethnicity, and gender. And she's one of the pioneers in the field of diaspora studies. Her books include cartographies of diaspora, Contesting Identities and Hybridity and Its Discontents and Thinking Identities and Global Futures. John Solomus is a professor of sociology at the University of Warwick and he has researched and written widely on the history and contemporary forms of race and ethnic relations in Britain, theories of race and racism, politics of race, equal opportunity policies, multiculturalism and social policy, race and football, um, and racist movements and ideas. His most recent books are Race, Ethnicity and Social Theory, which is due out with Routledge in 2021, and Race and Racism in Britain in its fourth edition, also out next year with Paul Grave. Um, and his most recent edited books are the Routledge International Handbook of Contemporary Racisms, 
and um, theories of race and racism uh, reader in its third edition and both of them with Routledge. He is co-editor of the journal Ethnic and Racial Studies, which has published 16 issues a year now by Routledge. And he is also co-editor of the book series on racism, resistance and social change for Manchester University Press and general editor of the Routledge Encyclopedia of Race and Racism. Nira, let me introduce you very briefly. Uh, Nira Yuval Davis is Professor Emeritus and Honorary Director of the Research Centre on Migration, Refugees and Belonging at the University of East London. She's a diasporic Israeli socialist feminist and has been active in different forums against racism and sexism in Israel and other settler colonial societies as well as UK and Europe. She's been the president of the Research Committee on Racism, Nationalism, Indigeneity and Ethnic Relations of the International Sociological Association, a founding member of Women Against Fundamentalism and the International Research Network on Women in Militarized Conflict Zones. And of course, this, this group, uh, the Social Scientists Against the Hostile Environment. Among her books, are Israel and the Palestinians, uh, woman, nation, state, racialized boundaries, we already saw, unsettling settler societies, gender and nation, women, citizenship and difference, warning signs of fundamentalism, situating the politics of belonging and the politics of belonging and women against fundamentalisms. And the most recent one is bordering. So, after this lengthy um, introduction um, for our distinguished speakers, may I start with um, asking Aftar uh, for a reaction um, or for your thoughts on the uh, on Floria's work, Floria's book, new book. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Great, okay. Right, well, I'm delighted at this opportunity to say a few words about this excellent book. At the heart of Loya and Thea's book is the problematic of difference, how to theorize difference and how to address the articulation of social differences constituted around such vectors as class, gender, race, and ethnicity. In the process, it reworks concepts of intersectionality, stratification, and political economy. It treats borders and boundaries of difference as translocationally constituted. The term translocational is preferred by her as the prefix trans draws attention to movement, flow, change, and it highlights the historical axis of movement. Equally, it interrogates the binary nature of the inter, that is between, and instead foregrounds the cross that brings into focus issues of multiplicity, fluidity, and change. The locational in the concept of translocational references social spaces marked by boundaries as well as hierarchy. The text is structured around contemporary dilemmas of difference and inequality. It offers an approach in which categories around difference are understood as modes of power, marking contradictory processes of inclusion, exclusion, oppression, violence, as well as belonging. Belonging is addressed in the text as a complexly inflected border-making principle. Its contemporary importance as a political and heuristic tool is underpinned by questions relating to the migration crisis and the predicaments facing refugees as they struggle to enter the borders of the nation state. And many in fact die in the process. Belonging is understood here as a bordering mechanism. And conversely, bordering is thematized as a modality of marking belonging. The book identifies belonging as compared with identity as its primary focus, mainly because it argues that struggles around membership, 
Nationality and citizenship are primarily engaged around issues of belonging, then struggle about identity. Though I have a slight reservation about this construction of binary. One of the important discussions in the book is that of the concept of intersectionality. The discussion begins from the position that the idea of the existence of interrelations between different axes of differentiation is not new. We know that. That relationality is a central theme of work ranging from Marxism to critical theory to earlier feminist and race analysis. Indeed, Floyd claims that relationality it has been central to much social theory. Given this, what, she asks, is new about intersectionality? In response, she suggests that the particular focus is new in that the approach is marked by a concern to analyze the intersections between central categories of difference, particularly gender and race, which have not received much attention in classical social theory. There is an ongoing debate, which is far from settled, as to whether intersectionality is a metaphor, a heuristic device, or a theoretical paradigm. Floyer favors the idea that it is a heuristic device, especially as this designates points, as this designation points to the formation of concepts in process rather than as pre-given. The key point is that intersectionality treats difference and power in a multi-layered form. It emerges out of a long tradition of activism and intellectual endeavor, which analyzes the interlocking multiplicity of oppressions faced by black and minoritized women. Moreover, it eschews the additive approach found in discussions of such ideas as double or triple oppression. In terms of the object of an intersectional analysis, the three ways of doing so are identified. And these three are the level of social ontologies of difference, the level of social categories of difference, and the level of concrete relations of difference. Importantly, the concept of class and stratification are analyzed in and through intersectionality. In other words, Class is located within an understanding of inequality and stratification from the vantage point of a translocational intersectional lens. As Floyer states, I quote, to think with class is to also After, I think you may have by accident muted yourself again. We lost your sound. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it is back now. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I don't know what, where I lost you, but I'll I'll go back to the um, uh, quotation from Floyer. That's where we lost you. Okay. So Floyer states that to think with class is to also think with gender and race in particular, and with their many articulations, including sexuality, migration, and so on, and vice versa. In other words, though class identifies inequality, inequality itself cannot be reduced to problems of class. The text also emphasizes the need to rethink a theory of stratification away from the binary of constructing production relations as material and ethnicity or gender as solely symbolic or cultural. Moreover, as the text argues, capitalisms are not abstract. Rather, and I quote, they are violent and subordinating and built on the exploitation, not only of the abstract worker, but the differential exploitation of differently marked bodies. Gender is another one of the categories analyzed here. It is theorized as embodying a central contradiction linked to codependency, mutuality, and intimacy on the one hand, and forms of control and violence on the other. This section explores the sex gender binary, nation and femo nationalism, gendered violence, trafficking, and intimacy and violations in transnational work. On rape, for instance, it argues against the position 
that rape cannot be differentiated from sexual consent. It examines the prevalence of rape as part of war and ethnic conflict. It analyzes domestic violence as well as honor-based violence. The work on global gender economy highlights how global capital harnesses traditional understandings of gendered bodies and addresses the role of migrant women's labor in sustaining global capitalism. This section also explores how the notion of authentic gender and identity is challenged by collective politics of transgender and reiterates the need for thinking with non-essential conceptions of gender. I think that's uh, the important thrust in, the, in this book about non-essential conceptions of everything really, but mainly gender. In the last chapter, the text addresses dilemmas of bordering the nation. It addresses a range of bordering processes in relation to collective categories and their contestation, and how belonging is politicized and policed. And it examines how the intersectional figure of the migrant becomes central to these discourses. Migration flows foreground the plight of migrants from the global south to the global north, as in the case of dangerous journeys embarked upon in the Mediterranean Sea and the US-Mexico border, where so many have died. Others survive, but find themselves sitting on borders in what have been called gray zones or they live in camps under dehumanizing conditions where they struggle to exercise agency and dignity. This has been demonstrated on our television, where we see pictures of the recent fire in which the Moira camp in Lesbos was engulfed. These conditions fuel a variety of racisms, including those favored by extremist right-wing parties and movements. There are also, for instance, Nativisms that prioritize the rights of native subjects, native in um, quotes, and surveillance racism based on the use of racialized biometric algorithms that underwrite biological racisms in new ways. In her concluding section of the book, Ploya outlines some reflections on how politics of translocation might be pursued. The book recognizes hierarchical relations, but less as categories than as processes. And that's an important emphasis and outcomes in spatio temporal ways. Workings of power oppress and oppressions remain central to the discussions throughout the book. The globalization of economic, social and cultural forms bounded by the nation state. Rather, we witness the transnational reach of class processes. Floya points to the limitations of dialogical politics. She, of course, um, values these politics, but she kind of points to some kind of um, limitations of it, favoring instead the importance of, I quote, asserting the right to have rights, that is, claiming the right to difference and the right to be equal despite difference. This text, in my view, is brimming with incisive theoretical and political analysis at its best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Afta, for giving us a really, um, really thoughtful reflection and framing, I think, also of Floria's book. This is really interesting. So the way that we'll proceed now is to move on directly to John, um, John Solomus and um, his comments. Can you unmute yourself or? Or can? Ah. Yes, great, thank you. John, can I invite you to share your comments? Oh, sorry, it's still, hang on. Just a minute, maybe I can. I think somebody has to unmute me. Yes, it has happened now. Thank you. My co-host, I think, has done that. Thanks. 
I think somebody muted me. I don't know why. <laughs> You're okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, well, first of all, let me say that uh, obviously this is a, a kind of like uh, an event online um, cannot be as much a celebration as we if we were meeting in person, but I hope nevertheless we can fulfill some aspects of the book lunch, which is to celebrate um, um, as a community that is interested in the, in the subjects covered by the book, uh, the achievements of Flora in publishing this book on translocational belongings. Um, and, and also to highlight some aspects of her contributions, which I think um, AFTA has already done in many ways, uh, but I will add some points uh, to that. Um, it's also, I think, um, not a, I think for me, book lunches, events like that are not really places for long um, critical discussion. They're more for reflection, dialogue, conversation. So it's in that spirit that I offer these comments. Um, I began reading the book um, when I received it um, and came across um, what I found to be quite a moving and interesting part of the book, which is the, um, the first few pages where Flora discusses her background in Cyprus, um, her mother, her father, um, the poetry of her father to some extent and the siblings and family that were part of her background. And I mentioned that because it seems to me um, what comes through in those uh, first few pages is that in a way this background in Cyprus, um, which is uh, also uh, my background um, in the sense that I also came to England as a child in a similar fashion to Flora, that it's a very tiny in ways. It's full of divisions, cultural and otherwise. Um, and it's full of um, claim to it. And I think John, we're having a little bit of problem with the sound at your end. Um, is it possible maybe to position yourself slightly differently towards the microphone? Can you hear me better now? Um, yeah, Can so there, me better now? there's an echo basically. That's what the problem is. There's All right. Echo. I wonder um, maybe you can turn your sound down a little bit, whether that might help. I can see um, that most of us have muted their microphone, so that should not be a problem. I don't get a sound myself. I, but, uh, is that okay? No. Can you can you hear me better? L yeah, there's still a little bit of a, uh, an echo, but I think perhaps yeah. This, let's try I again. I think we might have to. I'm sorry. So I guess I think the point I'm trying to make, in a way, is that this battle in Cyprus um, with, is important and um, something which is certainly important to aspects of the book about places, borders, which I think is an important um, aspect of the book. I think the I first think we can hear you better right now. Your face is emphasize the um, okay. The 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 I found interesting myself is the discussion um, that follows which is about the way in which um, over the last um, 20 years, particularly, I think, Flora has tried to use this concept of um, translocation, um, translocation and positioning in order to show that when we talk about migration, when we talk about transnational migration and other forms of mobility, um, what we find is that people are often positioned very um, differently in terms of gender, ethnicity, race, and class. And I think this aspect of her work over the last 20 years, which is in a way reflected in this book, um, emphasizes that one of the key elements of how borders and positioning themselves through borders and through belonging in various ways 
can be better understood if we use the kind of perspective that she's trying to encourage us to use, the perspective of what she calls a translocational lens, which I found um, an interesting kind of um, way uh, of um, thinking through some of the things, because I think what is particularly important in her work is the idea that borders are not just physical or territorial, they're also social, political, economic, and symbolic. And I think this aspect of her work, which has developed over the last uh, 20 years, particularly may maybe before, but at least I've become aware of it in reading her various papers and other work over the last 20 years, has provided us with interesting ideas. And I think in this book, um, it's one of the very important aspects of the book. Another aspect, which I think is quite in, is really very interesting in her work, is that like um, Patricia Hill Collins from a sociological view and Kimberly Crenshaw from a more legal theory kind of point of view, she engages with translocational um, ideas, but also with ideas about intersectionality, but tries also to link these ideas to how we can think through political um, movements and political ideas, as well as think through the theoretical dilemmas and issues which are raised. And I think her work, I think, um, although it has some similarities to Collins and to Crenshaw, I think what is different about her work and what is perhaps is in a way um, uh, writing from a perspective which emphasizes particularly issues about inequality, social inequality, as well as other kinds of inequalities, is that she tries to link her perspective very much to ideas about um, inequality, the, the kind of inequalities that exist in the wider society, in the political, in the social sense, and in other kind of ways. And I think this aspect of her work is particularly uh, reflected in a number of the so in a number of the seven chapters. That is what I found really quite challenging and interesting about this book. And it, it, it allows us to reflect that perhaps when we think about um, the, all the debates that are going on right now about the intersectionality, it's still important for sociologists to think through how intersectionality ties in with issues about inequality, social justice, those kind of debates, which are also, I think, part of the debates about intersectionality, about which need to be perhaps seen through um, perhaps a bit more uh, of a sociological kind of lens, which I think Floga um, in this book tries to do uh, quite um, uh, a lot in a very systematic way. And I think this is another important um, thing that I took from the book. Another um, facet of the book, which I think is interesting and which um, again, has been reflected in some of her earlier work over the last uh, 20 years, but I think which is uh, systematized and brought together very well in this book, is that she brings together ideas about um, place, nation, race, migration, in a, in a way which I think is, is unique and different from many writers in this field. Um, but she brings them together not just, I think, to um, make theoretical points, but I think throughout the book, she's trying to interlink her perspectives about place and nation and race and migration to ideas about how we can think through these issues to understand contemporary societies, not just this society, but other societies. And I think this again, I think is a, is a challenging and interesting part of the book, particularly in the later chapters of the book, this becomes quite an important feature of what she's trying to do. Now, I think to bring things together a bit in terms of some reflections and also just to invite Flora herself to um, perhaps tell us a bit more in conversation today about these things. I think one of the issues that interested me towards the end of the book in the last chapter and 
and perhaps the chapter before, is the way she tries to talk about translocational politics, the politics of solidarity, the politics of identity, but also the solidarity aspect particularly. And I think part of what I think she's trying to do in this as aspect of the book is to emphasize that in a way what we're living through at the present time, obviously we need to use conceptual, theoretical, analytical tools to understand what is happening. But I think what is also interesting about her, her attempt to bring a translocational politics into the book is the idea that um, in a way we need to engage with the critique of how we um, deal with um, political debates in our societies. For example, if we're studying inequalities in relation to migration or race, and of course this has come to the fore recently when we talk about things like the Black Lives uh, Matter, um, are the mobilizations which are taking place. Often these mobilizations um, are pretty much translocational in the sense that they try to draw their own borders to question the way in which borders have been constructed, not just within um, a global sense, but also within countries and those kind of issues. And I think in a way, part of the conversation, which I think Flora is trying to invite us to engage with at the end of the book, is to engage with this issue of the pol politics of what we, we do when we work on these issues. And I think this is another aspect of the book, which I found um, uh, interesting to myself, and I think it will be of interest more generally because it brings this debate about um, intersectionality, translocational positionings, the kind of debates that she's trying to bring to the attention of her audience in this book into also a debate about politics and a debate about, about, about how we can move beyond the politics of identity into some kind of politics about solidarity and and those kind of issues which she touches on at the end of the book and perhaps she will uh, expand a bit more in our conversation today. Um, so I found um, all facets of this book interesting. Um, I, you know, obviously many of the kind of debates that she engages in with uh, are ongoing debates and I think she acknowledges that, uh, but her contributions in this book are I think fascinating and interesting and should be of interest um, to people who are thinking through some of the kind of current debates about not just Black Lives Matter, but other kind of political mobilizations which are going on uh, in the context of um, migrant mobilizations or other mobilizations. So to, to finish, I just wanted to say, uh, as somebody who's known Floga for some time as well, not as long as some people, but for some time, uh, I congratulate her on this book. And I found it really in interesting as well as challenging. And, and, and I hope the conversation we have today will continue in future writings that she brings to our attention. So thank you, Flora. Thank you very much, John, for, for this really um, insightful and thoughtful um, reflection on Floya's book. So, we were we are planning on now holding a conversation a brief conversation floya and myself but maybe i can already start by inviting um everybody to think about questions comments they wish to make and uh that you can put into the chat box so um yeah in in a few minutes after after Floya's and my conversation, so a lot of the uh, a lot of really important and interesting issues have already been raised by both John and Afta. Um, a point that John made and that also really struck me was um, about the biographical connections that you have yourself to the topics that you're writing about. Um, and you really describe very, very 
very movingly, I'd say, your childhood, both in Cyprus and in England. Um, can you share some of this with us, maybe? Okay, thank you, Umut. First of all, I'd like to thank Aftar and John for taking part in this and for their, you know, really useful, um, uh, you know, sort of um, statements and reflections on my book. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank everybody who's here because I know it's not, it's not easy to participate in these events. Um, you know, in this way, and it's certainly not easy for me, um, where a book launch might be some, uh, like a little party, um, this is, um, you know, very different. So, you know, I really appreciate all the familiar faces I see around me here on my screen. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you for all the people that I don't know who are here as well. So that's the first thing. Now, Umut, you asked me about the importance of my biography. And I think that um, it's true for most of us that, you know, what we do, what we write is very much a product of our lives and of course, of our experiences. And for me, um, it was doubly so in terms of the importance of boundaries and um, in terms of contestations and inequalities because I come from a small society um, where conflict has been part of everyday life for most people for a very long time particularly what's defined as ethnic conflict and as a small child growing up um, that conflict was only manifested through an anti-colonialist struggle. So um, in the late 50s, as a small child, I witnessed um, the struggle against colonialism and the form that it took um, where I was at the meeting point between being part of a family that was anti-colonialist, but part of a family where the form that the anti-colonialist struggle took was regarded as wrong because the anti-colonialist struggle in Cyprus was um, led primarily by right-wing nationalist forces, by OCA. And my father was um, not only a member of the Communist Party, but he was um, um, an important uh, member of, um, uh, he was a journalist on the Communist uh, newspaper, and um, he was also um, someone who wrote um, very um, strongly about, um, you know, about politics and about life. He was a passionate advocate of freedom and socialism. So I was caught between these two things, you know, being anti-colonialist, but also being against um, the form that it took. And we were attacked as a family by both sides. My father was imprisoned by the British, um, not for the first time, I should say, in his life, imprisoned by the British, but he was imprisoned by the British because of his anti-colonial writings. Um, and he was also attacked by the Ioka fighters as well. So um, we were threatened, um, he, he received a letter, for example, um, from the nationalist uh, leaders of the anti-colonialist struggle, saying that if he didn't stop writing things against the form that it took, then we would be killed. And so, and coming out from school, of course, um, I witnessed a lot of violence, dead bodies in the street. We were under curfew much of the time. So this has been, this during a very formative part of my life has been very important aspect of directing me in the direction that I've taken, I think. And the second part of my biography, of course, is more later on in British society, my experiences in Britain, not only as a child, but later, and in Britain, being an outsider, being othered at school, um, and, you know, feeling I never really belonged in British society ever. 
Of course, I didn't experience the kind of racism that, you know, many others have done um, because I'm not so visibly different. But my, my name and my mother at the school gate gave me away. And of course, you know, um, being here positioned as an outsider has been part of my everyday life. I've always felt that. Uh, in everyday life. So I've always been interested in examining and understanding othering and resisting it and trying to think through ways in which we can tackle this terrible problem of othering, of racism and of a difference which is violating of the human person. Yes, that's, and that's of course something that you write about so with such clarity, those, those issues of bordering, boundaries, uh, and hierarchies. Um, maybe just to uh, continue a little bit longer with that idea of um, reflecting on your positionality as uh, uh, currently, let's say, in terms of your own translocationality. So something that kind of struck me is the, how you reflect about your father as a diasporic writer and perhaps your own self having developed a really different mode of being a diasporic writer as well. Is that yeah. something? Yeah. It's interesting because I've always resisted the idea of diasporic. As, as you know, I've uh, written about the problems of the term um, and the way sometimes it's used. Um, but I don't think of myself primarily as a diasporic writer. My father was a diasporic writer because he came and lived in England and his whole life in a way was dedicated still to Cyprus, even though he was part of the Communist Party here. Um, he was very centrally part of the Cypriot community and he wrote about Cyprus and so on. And his poetry was geared much more to the struggles of Cyprus or more, and also of course more global international struggles because he wrote about Vietnam and he wrote about uh, Hiroshima and so yeah. on. But um, I think I'm only diasporic because I came over very young. I was only three when I came here the first time uh, and the second time I was 12 because I and I most of my life is, is spent in Britain. I'm only diasporic in as much as I'm positioned with an understanding and a knowledge of what it means to be different in British society. Um, that may be someone who was born and bred in uh, of a, a so-called whatever native British or native English is, might not be aware of. And I think this has sensitized me to a lot of things. Um, but I should say that um, I wouldn't put too much stress on um, experience always sensitizing one because I can think of many people in that position who haven't been sensitized to otherings and difference um, in the way that perhaps some of us have been who still persist in othering others. You know, it doesn't guarantee just because you have been othered that you won't other others. Um, as we've seen, for example, people voting um, for Brexit or for populist parties um, or nationalist parties, even though they might have been migrants and um, not in indigenous English. Yes, absolutely. So well, positioning, positioning oneself is just as important and in particular through values and through political orientations, isn't it? I very much agree, yeah. So maybe can you talk us through some of the main parameters of the book? Um, something that's been raised both by Afta and John is um, how you're incorporating class analysis into your uh, writing on inequalities, hierarchies, boundaries. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it's, 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 it's very important that we locate our writing in relation to what we're writing against and um, you know, the political and economic and, and 
if you like, sociological context within which we're writing. So for example, when Nira and I were writing Racialized Boundaries, we were very much producing an argument which said it's not just about class. We have to also look at issues of gender, ethnicity, race. Um, and we were developing, if you like, a kind of prototypical, particularly in 1983, intersectional analysis, um, which um, hadn't been developed very much around us. So our task was countering. So, for example, in many of our chapters, we were countering existing arguments um, about race and about gender. In the context today, writing this book, this is very different because um, intersectional work has developed and flourished and is burgeoning around us. And what we find perhaps is diamet diametrically opposite in terms of class, whereas in racialized boundaries, we were kind of trying to correct an overemphasis on class. In this book, what I'm trying to do is bring back class, but not in the traditional sense, but rethinking the parameters of class so that it no longer becomes identified just with economic inequality. So many of the arguments about class see it as class is about economic inequality. That's what underpins it. Whereas in this book, I argue that we can't think of Although class is a different kind of category and congruent relation to those of gender and ethnicity race, for many, in many ways which I explore in the book, which I can't really talk about now because it's too complex an argument um, to make now, um, nonetheless, um, class, um, class is, a mo is, is, a, is a pathway, it's an important central pathway through which inequality works but it's not on its own enough to understand forms of inequality. And um, I think important part of this is that I've, what I argue in this book is that capitalism, particularly modern capitalism, neoliberal capitalism, very much depends on categories of difference doing some of the work of inequality as central elements of the inequality landscape. And that without um, these categories, which shift and change, become more fixed or more fluid as um, economic and political projects change of those in power, um, then um, you know, these play an important function in the pursuit of the economic and political projects of states and of um, capitalists. So although I'm not, um, you know, I'm in a way working back towards a Marxism, but a Marxism that needs to incorporate um, the notion of embodied labor, i.e. the bodies of real people are marked in particular ways in capitalism and the marking of these bodies actually play an important role in the way capitalism um, is able to pursue its project, um, its inequality project. Um, and of course we know that although capitalism and modern capitalism is very concerned with addressing the problems of gender and ethnic inequality, however cynically um, and, and however poorly it's done, it doesn't actually concern itself with class because the, the inequality of class, the unequal resources that are allocated to class positions is part of the foundational element of capitalism. So for example, there's no legislation against uh, class discrimination or uh, positive action programs around class. I mean, there are equal, um, there are issues in universities, for example, of allowing more working class students in. But that doesn't actually change the class structure. Um, and what I'm arguing in a way in this book is that we should treat more equal resource allocation as a basic human and social right. Um, and that it shouldn't 
Um, you know, we just as we argue for gender equality and race equality, we should also be arguing for class equality, that the outcomes for people, irrespective of the work that they do, irrespective of the way they're categorized or their role in the production system, um, irrespective of this, they, there should be a, a social and human right to equality on the basis of humanity and not on the basis of the type of job that you do or your relation to the means of production. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers, both uh, Aftal and John and Floya, of course. It's been a really wonderful opportunity to celebrate your work. And um, so it's been great to be here. Let me just pass on to Nira now. Thank you very much, um, Umut, for sharing it so well, and to uh, Taro and, and John for talking about um, Floya's book in, in such a uh, articulate way, and of course to Floya and to all the richness and as well as rigorousness of her analysis. But as more than everything else, I think, the discussion uh, illustrated what social scientists against hostile environment really want to achieve, which is not just academic discussion and not just political discussion, but interrelate the two, because we are all committed to fight against racism, inequalities, and for social justice. <laughs>